This episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast is intended for mature audiences. It contains strong language, violent recollections, and mature themes that might be inappropriate for younger audiences. Viewer and listener discretion is strongly advised. Back in 2016, my friends and I, for the longest time, had been itching to go camping to our local camping site in the Los Padres National Park in Southern California. When we found the perfect weekend to go that didn't interfere with any of our work schedules, we set the date. Three days before the trip, we found out we were going to get hit by the El Nino rainstorm. Us, being the types of dudes that we are, didn't care if we got hit by the storm while camping. So we packed up our cars and made the 45 minute drive to the campsite. The campsite was a family friendly one where there were about a hundred camping lots that circled around the clearing in the forest. We found the perfect spot that was underneath huge thick trees that would help block as much rain as possible and it helped out that the restrooms were only 30 yards away. As soon as we got to our spot, we took advantage of the afternoon sky being cleared for the moment and we rushed to set up our spot. The layout that we did was that we pitched our tents close by where our tents were only six feet apart. The reason why we did this is because in order to combat the rain, I brought a 30 by 30 foot thick blue canopy tarp that I threw over to cover us from the rain above and from the rain that would be running through the ground. It was a genius move on my part, but whenever you would walk around our tent, you would be making so much noise from crunching the plastic tarp. Hours passed and we were all around the campfire. It was late into the evening and this was the first time that I noticed that there were barely any other campers. They were mainly camping in their RVs, like the fake campers they were. In honest opinion, they were the smart ones, unlike my friends and I that were sleeping in two small tents with our only protection being the blue tarp. I was getting tired from a long day of work and I decided that I was going off to knock out. My friends followed my lead as well. The way that the sleeping arrangements were was that I had my friend Ray sleeping in my tent and AJ and S were sleeping in theirs. Before I called it a night however, I whispered to Ray and told him, I'm going to prank call S and AJ, but I'm not going to say anything. Ray smiled as I dialed my friends up. I called them unrestricted and S's phone started to ring off. Both of them, being the way they were, got timid very easily as they said to one another, Who's calling you this late in the night? I don't know. They called me unrestricted. Are you going to answer? Of course not. Ray and I were holding in our laughter as they ignored our call. I decided to do it one more time. Once their phone started to ring, they started to freak out once again, and they said, Who is it this time? Same person, I think. I'm not going to answer. As they did answer, S said in a very shaking tone, Hello? Ray and I had to hold in our laughter as we kept as quiet as possible, not wanting to make any noise that would give off that it was us. I held the phone close to my mouth as I began to breathe heavily in a murderous way. I ended the call and just hearing them freak out the way they did was making my night even funnier. Me being the idiot I am though, called them one more time and this time S picked up the phone immediately and said in a tough voice, Look, whoever this is, you better stop. I'm about to call the cops if you keep on calling. This is not a threat. Ray and I looked at one another as we at the same time began to fake moan so loud and immediately started to bawl out in laughter. A, J, and S were so mad at us for pulling this prank on them and they were cursing us out. Me finally calming down from laughing so loudly, told the boys, Good night, I will have pancakes ready in the morning. Since I fell asleep relatively easily, I was out in a matter of minutes, while Ray, A, J, and S were up for a while longer. I was the first of my friends to wake up in the morning and as I promised, I had the pancakes already cooking by the time that anyone else woke up. 
The smell of me cooking woke up my friends, and one by one, they got out of their tents. As we were eating, AJ spoke up and said, Hey, Jay, the prank that you pulled last night went a little too far. Yeah, you had us ready to run to our car and take off. Me feeling a bit guilty, apologized and responded with, Sorry guys, my bad. Yeah, it's one thing to prank call us like that, but then to walk around our tent and then go inside it in the middle of the night is totally out of limits, S said. Me not knowing what they were talking about said, What do you guys mean? Come on, still with the jokes? You were the one that was walking around our tent and you walked in. Ray spoke up and said, That wasn't Jay who was walking around. I thought that was you two getting your revenge on us for scaring you. That wasn't us doing that. It was you two. So, to explain, after I fell asleep, about an hour had passed where Ray, S, and AJ were still up and all was quiet in the forest until the sounds of footsteps were heard stepping on our blue tarp that was on the ground. At first, my friends thought that it could have been just a forest animal wandering around, but the heavy footsteps were a dead giveaway that it was a person. As they described, the person was walking all around our tents, making constant figure eights. The person would place their fingers on the tent's fabric walls to run them up and down. The footsteps finally stopped after a couple of minutes, right in between our tent's doors. The three of them were already having their hearts pounding out of their chest. It was silent for a long minute, until the sound of the tent zipper being slid open. As AJ says, the tent's door was only open halfway, but it was too dark to see anything clearly. But in the darkness, both S and AJ saw the silhouette of a man's face pop his head into the tent to look at both of them. AJ and S faked being asleep the entire time, but they kept their eyes locked onto the man. The man then opened the tent fully and walked inside the tent, just standing at the entrance. The man didn't say a word or do anything, just watched the both of them laying in their sleeping bags. After their longest minute ever, the man just took his steps out of the tent and his footsteps were heard walking away, disappearing into the night. The entire time that this was happening, S and AJ thought that it was either me or Ray doing this, and Ray thought that it was AJ or S doing it. Back to us arguing back and forth at the breakfast table, we were interrupted by a man walking to our campsite, and he said, Good morning, boys. How did the four of you sleep last night? This man spoke in a smoker's voice, as if he has been doing that for all of his 45 years of being alive. He wore a dirty sweat stained white t-shirt that looked more gray at this point and his blue jeans looked as if they had never been taken off from his pants. He smelt like liquor, not a good sign at 8 in the morning and his words were just mumbling around. We didn't say anything to this guy as he then asked us if we had any cigarettes to spare him. I said that we didn't smoke and he said, Oh well if you boys want to visit me in my RV, just stop by anytime. The man continued to walk away, towards the restrooms, and as he was done using it, he walked back to our campsite. He didn't say anything this time, but he looked at us and gave us a nearly toothless smile, and he walked back to his RV. I took note of his RV, as it was the only RV that stuck out as being dirty and more run down than the others. We quickly summed up the man as the person who was walking around our tents last night, and S and AJ now remembered that they smelt liquor from the person who was standing in their tent. We all agreed that we would keep an extra eye on this guy, and if he did spend another night, we would most likely report him to the park rangers if he tried anything else. When it was around lunchtime now, the man came back, not to use the restroom, but just to talk to us. So, are any of you boys interested in buying an RV? You all can go check it out right now and see if you want to buy it. I don't need it anymore since my wife left me. Just check out the inside of the RV. No, we're good, sir, I said with a visible, threatening tone. The man seemed to notice this and he walked away. The man did end up leaving a few hours before sunset, but the entire time that he was there, he kept glancing at us. The man had his RV about 50 yards away from us 
and I noticed that he had a restroom right next to his RV. Why did he make an effort in walking all the way over to our campsite to use our restroom? Also, why did he even use ours if RVs come with restrooms installed in them? Whatever the man wanted, we were just glad that we were about to enjoy the rest of our weekend in peace. The time was around 1am, and my cousins, brother, and I were craving the late night McDonald's run. They lived near the edge of the city where the highway begins and the strawberry fields were located. It was a quiet evening and my car was parked near the highway. There was a metal fence that separated where my car was parked and the highway. As we were heading to my car, we see this white truck speeding down the highway, going way above 100 miles an hour. It's speeding towards us like a bat out of hell. Nothing usual about this since it was late in the evening and it was part of the road where cops were never posted at. As they're getting closer to us, we were about to hop into my car. Right when that happens, we hear a loud sound of something slamming onto the highway and the white truck suddenly stops. The four of us jerk our heads to see what it was and we see a buildup of tire smoke that surrounded the truck. That's how hard the truck came to a halt. As the smoke clears, I see that there's a body laying face down on the road. My heart drops when I had no idea on what just happened. The white truck is just idling there in the middle of the highway for a few seconds before it takes off down the highway again. My worst fear is that this is a case of hit and run and I wasn't able to get a license plate of the truck. The four of us are not in the best states, especially with how late it was. So the best that we could do is just watch in horror as we see this seemingly lifeless body laying in the road. He isn't moving, yelling in pain, or showing any signs of life. I want to go rush towards the guy and right when I make a move, my brother stops me and tells me that the truck is coming back. I see that the truck is reversing the entire way and none of us knows what's going to happen next. The driver of the white truck rolls down its window and screams, get back in the truck. To our relief, the person slowly gets up and makes their way back into the truck. In a few short moments, the truck was now gone and it was as if nothing had happened. We are hoping that this was just one of those cases of where drunken buddy accidentally opens their car door and falls out nothing sinister, such as someone trying to escape a trafficker. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. I've read so many stories here, so I decided to submit mine. About six years ago, I was with my friend Tom at my parents' cabin. We decided to head off to a casino located on the Ojibwe Reserve, about 40 minutes away. The entire stretch of highway between is heavily forested and has no lights whatsoever, meaning it can get incredibly dark. We got there and played some poker, tried a few table games, and grabbed some dinner with our winnings. Pretty successful night overall for the both of us. We ended up leaving the casino around 1am, a little later than I would have liked given the lack of any street lights. We drive for about 20 minutes on the highway without passing any other vehicles and this is when I noticed two green orbs just off the highway before a hill. Realizing that it was a deer, I slammed on the brakes and waited. Several deer crossed and we resumed driving. The car was going slowly up the hill because it was a starting stop. Now, as soon as we make the crest of the hill, Tom screamed, Holy crap! Right in front of us was a young woman walking in the middle of our lane towards us, no more than maybe 30 feet away. I then slam on the brakes again and come within 10 feet of her. Thankfully, slowing down earlier and climbing the hill meant that we weren't going fast enough, but what was going through my mind wasn't the fact that I nearly ran over someone. 
It was that this young woman with pitch black hair was wearing a white nightgown with no shoes and was still walking towards us with a blank, expressionless face. Not gonna lie, that image frightened me because it looked like something straight out of a horror movie. Tom and I waited to see if she was going to pull up to our window and maybe ask for help or something. She made it to the front of my car and went around to the driver's side. She didn't stop, but she raised her hand and dragged it across the side of my car while continuing her walk. At this point, Tom and I were both freaked out. I asked Tom, what do we do? He said that we should just get out of here, and for whatever reason, I just didn't feel right about leaving and not asking if she was alright. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw that she was still walking. Having almost hit her and knowing that something just wasn't right, I decided to do something. I told Tom that I was going to ask if she was alright. Tom pleaded that we just go and get out of there, but I put on some bravado and told him not to worry and that I would be right back. I put on my blinkers and I stepped out of my car. I left my door open to provide some light and I walked around to the trunk of my car. My interior lights didn't do much, but blinkers allowed me to see an outline of her slightly down the hill, only able to see her every other second. I half yelled, are you alright? She finally stopped walking but still faced the other way. There was no response. I then heard Tom's door open as he was getting out to join me. Suddenly, she started screaming. Tom and I ran back into my car and I just floored it. I got a lot of crap from Tom for the remainder of the ride back to my cabin. Haven't heard or seen anything like that on the highway since then. And I'm pretty thankful for it. That was the creepiest moment of my life. When I was 17 slash 18 ish, I was driving home from a friend's house after a movie marathon. It was around 1 a.m. when I left in a decent drive. Not quite halfway though, my gas light came on. I had a few creepy cat call experiences at gas stations, and I was a little bit paranoid stopping that late in the middle of nowhere as a 110 pound teenage girl. In the end, I think, if I wasn't so cautious, I would have been kidnapped or killed. The first gas station I came across was well lit and in a pretty open space. I drove up to the pump and looked around my car mirrors before getting out as I was starting to pump gas. This normal looking guy comes out of the gas station shop and starts smoking a cigarette the pump kept clicking off and not working, so I started messing with it trying to get it to pump. This guy now starts watching me and laughing. I assumed he was just laughing to himself watching a teenage girl trying to pump gas. After getting maybe a quarter of a gallon, I gave up and moved to a new pump. After this point, if I didn't do absolutely everything I did, I would have been screwed. When I got back into my car, I locked my doors just to drive to the other pump. I checked all my mirrors before getting out or shutting off my car again. It's an old 90s beetle that didn't always start right away. That's when I saw the guy walking up to my car. He was smiling, walking up to the driver's side window. Now, not wanting him next to me, I rolled down the passenger window. He then paused for a moment, and then smiled to himself and walked to the passenger window. He stuck his head all the way inside my window to talk to me. He says, Hey, I know this seems kind of weird, but I promise I'm not a creep or anything. My car broke down. He then proceeds to point to a red SUV, and I need a ride home. It's just half a mile up the road. I respond, Sorry, but I don't know you. He then says, Oh no, I totally get it. I thought it was pretty weird as I was walking up here, but it's only half a mile up the road. I'm totally stranded. Me. Oh, I wish I could help you, but I really don't know you. Him. Yeah, I got ya. If you had a truck or something, I'd offer to ride in the back. Me. Sorry, no. All of a sudden, he looked pissed. He yanked at my door, but I had it locked before. 
Then he reached for my inside door handle through the window. My car was still running by the way, and I slammed it into first and peeled out as he opened the door. The car taking off is what slammed the door shut, and I sped off. I called the police after I got away. They looked at the gas station cameras, and right after I left, he got into his red SUV and drove off. I apologize for the length of this story, it is the most terrifying thing that I've ever experienced. This happened four years ago, when my boyfriend and I were still sort of fresh into the relationship. My sister had recommended me a snorkeling trip for a fun thing to do with him. It was this quarry surrounded by a campground that is filled in with water and is known for its crystal clear water and it's diving. There is apparently a helicopter and school bus that people dive down to see. My boyfriend and I decided to go camping for the night. While we were checking in, we separately both got a bad feeling about the place, but had kept it to ourselves until after we left. So at first it was a really good time. We snorkeled in the shallowish area of the quarry, and although the depth of the water was a bit uncanny, I was still enjoying myself. The water is 65 feet deep, so once you had swam out of the shallow area, it immediately dropped off and it was pitch black. This is actually where I realized I'm terrified of water. Besides the dark deep water while you were swimming, there is something very scary about a lake that is perfectly still. I assume because it's a quarry and the water doesn't have a current. My boyfriend and I are winding down our night and we're back at our campsite. We are camping in a grassy patch down a hill from the road. Our tent is pitched in a wooded area that our campsite is extended to and just across the green is a campsite that looks well lived in but our neighbors were out. We're making hot dogs over the fire when our neighbors get back. It's nighttime now and they immediately go to sleep. And I'd say 20 to 30 minutes after they get back is when things started to become spooky. My boyfriend and I were chatting and this is when we noticed a dark figure watching us from up the hill. Because of the shadow of the fire, we could not actually make out the characteristics of the figure, but we knew he was staring directly at us, almost hiding behind our neighbor's truck. He had watched us for what felt like forever until he started walking down the road again. We both watched him in dead silence, watching him walk behind trees, the same ones connected to our campsite but that also went in between us and him. I anticipated each time I'd see him walk forward out from behind a tree and it was a good four or five he came out from. It wasn't until after this I noticed he had stopped walking or he was behind the tree still. I was totally freaked out regardless. Where did he go? I watched my boyfriend looking at what happened and thinking the same thing, but he had shrugged it off and I naively did too. We actually ended up forgetting about it and went to the quarry late at night. It was beautiful seeing the stars reflected against the water, but the deep now all black water was terrifying to say the least. We walked back to our campsite, lied in our tent, and smoked a joint. I soon began to feel an uneasy feeling which I was trying to ignore, telling myself it's because I was high. After some silence between us, my boyfriend says to me, Do you feel like we're being watched? I said, Why would you say that? Half joking, but full serious that I was scared. My boyfriend wanted to get out from the tent, so we're standing by my car, and this is when I got this stupid idea that being in the middle of the field that's in the middle of the campground is the safest place for us. My logic being, if someone was going to come up at us, at least we'd be able to see them. So we're in the middle of this field when we see a similar looking shadow figure from earlier staring at us. He must have been about 20 yards away. We both notice him while walking and he's walking in the same direction at us. We change directions and so does he. We now tell one another if we change again and he does too, that we're booking it to my car. When we change, he follows 
and we do book it to the car. I watched him from my seat as he slowly walked back into the darkness while still staring in our direction. My boyfriend at this point says to me, let's get out of here. I agree, but all our camping gear is outside. So we quietly get our things together, not trying to freak the other one out. The weirdest part of the story in my opinion is the next part. My headlights weren't working and there was a weird fog over my windshield that didn't go away no matter what I did. We had to drive out of the woods with only low beams and a strange fog over the window. We barely could see, but we did get out of there. Weirdly enough, the fog went away right as soon as we got to the gas station and we got home around 1 at night. I told my father this story the next day and he said he's glad we got out of there or else we could have gotten murdered. Two people have died at this campground while snorkeling, which I found out after I got back. My boyfriend and I think that it was either a person trying to kill us or a wendigo. We've kind of settled on the wendigo because what happened was so unexplainable to us. But anyway, thanks for reading. This is my first post here. Hope I have enough karma this time to share my story. Also, English isn't my first language, but I tried my best. Sorry. First, a bit of context. When I was younger, from my 10 years old to my 15 years old, now 19 years old, and female, I used to live in a semi-rural area, like small cities with some fields around. During this time, I used to have a best friend that lived in another city, but still close enough so we can go to each other's houses by our own. Indeed, there was a really long road that crossed both of our cities, and another one farther, and we both lived really close to that road. We used to see each other almost every day, but my friend Alan and I almost never texted each other, because even if I was a lot into social media and stuff, he was the kind of guy that almost never used his phone, so he ended up losing his phone in his home or at a friend's house a lot. So the only time we texted each other, it was to warn the other one if we weren't able to meet up that day, or if no one sent anything that morning or the day before, it meant that we will see each other later that day. If the weather wasn't good enough to stay outside, I used to go to his house. He has better video games. The path I used to take to go to his house was something like one and a half kilometers. It was the only way possible because the cities were separated by a river so we had to pass the bridge to go from a city to another. I will describe you the path so you can imagine it. First, there are a lot of homes, then only few houses and a chemical factory on the other side of the road, then nothing but trees from my side and still the factory from the other. Then the bridge is not a really long one because it's not a big river. On my side, there is two paths that go on both shores of the river where few people used to walk or fish. After the bridge, there is nothing but trees until the end where there is a warehouse and the street where Alan lives. I took this path thousands of times, either with him, my parents, or even on my own. Though there's not a lot of people walking there, it never made me nervous to walk there, even when it started to get dark. But as I've said earlier, this road connected three cities, so usually there are some vehicles driving there. One day, however, something went wrong. This story takes place when I was 13 years old. I was heading to Alan's house as usual, and when I reached the area with less homes, a white van that was coming from behind me slowed down next to me with the window open. Several times before, lost drivers have asked me or my friends information on where to go, so it didn't really surprise me and I just watched the man inside of the van. Now, I don't quite remember anymore how he looked like, I just remember that he was in his 30s or 40s, bald, with no mustache nor beard. He has a kinda creepy smile. But I didn't pay attention to that and just waited for him to say something as I kept walking slowly. Since I was walking though, he moved too, at my pace, so we can talk. Hello, 
he said finally. I said, hello, still waiting for a question. Where are you going? He asked, smiling and staring at me. I frowned, because of course, this wasn't the type of question I was waiting for. At this point, I wasn't scared yet, just confused. I asked him why he wants to know that, to which he replied with, if you have nothing to do, I can take you for a ride. Would you like that? This started to get really weird and I really wanted him to leave me alone because I started to get scared. I chose to lie, thinking he will leave me alone if he knows that someone is waiting for me. So I said, I can't. I'm going back home and my parents are waiting for me. But of course, he didn't leave. He was still smiling and staring at me, driving at my pace. He just said, it's okay. We can just do a small drive. I knew at this point that this man was trying to kidnap me, or much worse, but I managed to stay calm and not show him fear. I insisted, No, but really, I can't. I'm already late. I have to hurry up. However, it seems that he really wanted to do whatever he was planning to do with me, and he replied with, Oh, then, I'll just drive you home. I don't want you to get scolded. But for that, you have to give me a kiss. He then leaned closer to the window and formed a kiss with his mouth, waiting for me to kiss him. At this point, we were really close to the bridge, which means that Alan's house was still far. For some reason, I didn't have the idea to just turn around and run for my life to my home or the factory, so I just kept walking and refused his offer. Of course, he insisted, Come on, just one kiss, right here. I remember wishing that a car or somebody would show up to help me, but the road was deserted that day. He insisted a few more times, and I kept saying no, getting more scared each time. Eventually, once we were crossing the bridge, an idea crossed my mind. What I didn't mention earlier is that on the second shore, there is a house and it's where the person that takes care of the sluice and their family live. Usually no vehicle is allowed to go down on the shore, so I thought he wouldn't follow me if I go there. So I said, no really I don't need you, my home is right there, and quickly I turned to the right to go home, air quotations there. However, that was only a half smart move, because except the house, there is nothing but trees and water for almost three kilometers, so if there was no one in the house or on the shore, I would have been at his mercy. Like what if he waited on the bridge and saw that nobody opens the door? He could have just gone down and taken me. Thankfully, there was a man walking with his dog right next to the house, so I ran to him and immediately crouched in front of the dog to pet him trying to act like he was my dad or something. Obviously, the man was really confused, so I proceeded to explain him the whole thing. But turns out he didn't give a crap about it and walked away before I finished my story. I watched him leave. He was heading toward the bridge. I noticed that the van was not there anymore, and I was relieved. But I didn't want to go back on the road because I was scared that he was hiding just a bit farther waiting for me. I stayed next to the house, two to three minutes, trying to find what to do now, and this is when a white van crossed the bridge again, slowly. When I saw it, I got terrified, thinking that it was him again. The van was a really common van with no distinction, so I can't tell if it was really him, but they were driving really slowly, like they were looking for something. I froze for a few seconds and then I ran for my life along the shore for a long time, before then jumping into the forest. I ran something like two kilometers, and to be honest, I didn't think I was able to run that much. When I finally arrived at Alan's house, it took me ten minutes to catch my breath. I was shaking and totally exhausted after running that much. Now, I don't remember why, but instead of knocking at the door, I called him on his phone. And guess what? That was one of the rare days in the year when he wasn't home, but he forgot to text me in the morning. I stayed next to his house for two hours, 
I was too scared to go back home because I thought he was still on the road, but also I didn't want to call my parents because I was scared that they'd forbid me to go to Alan's house alone. Anyway, I eventually came back home, but instead of using the same path, I went through the forest and walked along the shore for a long time, seeking another bridge. My parents still don't know about this story to this day. Anyway, creepy man that wants kisses from a 13 year old girl. Let's not meet again. This happened about two years ago, in my second year of university. I was 20 years old. For context, I'm French, so if anything's weird about how I describe university experience, that's why. At the time, I lived in a government-owned apartment building on the third floor. My direct neighbor was my younger sister, who was studying in the same university as I did. One other thing important to the story is that I'm disabled. My right leg is useless after an accident when I was 13 years old, and I suffer from horrendous chronic pain, to a degree that keeps me bedridden and nonverbal unless I take a twice a day dosage of prescribed morphine. All of that is important details by the way, so bear with me. When I take my medication, I'm able to leave my bed. On the worst days, I have to either use a wheelchair or a cane to get around. Isn't it great that we lived on the third floor of a building with no elevator? On top of that, as you might guess, morphine is a very strong pain medication. It screws with your visual and hearing perception. It makes you sleepy and dizzy, lessens your reflexes, numbs your nervous system, makes you paranoid. You get the idea. At the time, I had only been taking morphine for less than six months, after ten years of various other pain medication and I was still dealing with the side effects in full force. Most of them are gone now. So for me, that meant mainly auditory hallucinations, sleepiness, dizziness, and bad reflexes slash nervous response. At that point, I'd gotten used to hearing stuff that wasn't there, mostly clapping noises, clicking noises, small things ultimately. I never hallucinated human voices, however. That night, I had gone out of the center of the city to meet with friends. This was a rare occasion for me, and I do mean rare. I didn't go out more than once every two months or so, for multiple reasons that my friends, bless them, understood me perfectly. Morphine means no drinking, so that's half the fun of going to the bar removed from the get-go. Now, despite the very useful nature of the medication, I was still, and still, am in a tremendous amount of pain if I stand for more than a couple of minutes, and I was sure to do a lot of that at the bar, plus walking back from the bus stop to my building, about a five minute walk. But I went anyway, like I did exceptionally. For a few days there had been rumors going around about a group that was going around kidnapping people from my university. From memory, two girls had disappeared already, and it was suspected that a blue van was the vehicle used. Those reports were circulating on our major groups, and on the university's group as well, about the same details each time, but my friends and I were skeptical, mostly about the blue van, because we didn't believe the van would still be running around if the information had spread enough that we were hearing about it on Facebook. You know, not that I was thinking about any of that as I came back from the bar around midnight. Early, I know, but... I was in a lot of pain and the bus stops at half past midnight and missing it would mean waking up my sister so she could pick me up at the tram station since I was physically unable to walk the 20 minutes required. I got into the bus. Only three people were there and none got out of my bus stop. Now bear in mind that I was in an extreme amount of pain, so much that my vision was blurring out on the edges and I was swaying a bit from side to side, trying to minimize the weight being put on my leg. On top of that, I had just taken a fast working morphine dose to help me get through the five minute walk back to my building, and unlike my twice a day high dosage, those pills I could take to my discretion whenever I needed a quick relief. The downside of that very practical pill 
is that it basically knocks you out in 30 minutes. You get so sleepy you can barely keep your eyes open, and basically, you're high for about 20 minutes before either passing out or getting through it, and it gets better after a while. Anyway, I get out of the bus. On my right is a parking lot in front of a bakery with a lot of cars. It's normal because there are a lot of government-owned student flats around that block, and that's where most of them park, so I'm not concerned. The road I take is straight from where the bus dropped me off. For the whole walk before my building, to the right, is a couple of parking spots, and in front of it is a wheelchair slope going to a magnetic door. You need your magnetic student ID to open the door, then a key to the specific door to your building. As I walk by the parking lot, I see movement in the corner of my eye. However, since I'm still half out of it from pain and medication, I don't turn to look at it, but I hear some noise, and I just assume I'm hallucinating, so I keep on walking. But then the street lights reflect on a car window, and I don't know why that made me turn around. My brain was catching on to some weird stuff. So I briefly look to the side, and I see an old, beat-up white car, pretty long and low to the ground. On the driver's seat is an Algerian man in his mid-fifties. The neighborhood of being half students, half French-born Algerian. The thing that gives me pause is more the fact that there's someone awake in the front seat of a car at one in the morning. But again, I'm out of it, so I don't question it. I don't even stop walking, because at this point, my only thought is, put one foot in front of the other. There you go. You're almost there. You're almost done with the pain. Literally, all my attention, my focus, was putting one foot after the other because of the terrible pain. I walk past the small roundabout to my left, still going straight, when I hear a car starting. I don't know why that was the thing that slapped me in the face, but suddenly, I was worried. My heart was beating fast, most likely half the medication and half the fear. But also, I was well aware that morphine tends to make me paranoid, so I tried to calm down. I see the headlights coming from behind me, drawing a long shadow in front of me. In a second, I run through the calculations. I'm still about 300 meters, a thousand feet says Google, from my building. Then I need to get my ID out and open the door. A slow, automatic magnetic door. I can't run. I can barely walk. I'm up to the head in morphine. It's the middle of the night. I'm alone, with no residential building close enough to hear a scream. And that's when I start to panic. I'm right to do so. The car catches up to me now, slows down to my walking speed, and I notice that the man isn't alone in the car anymore. Someone is in the passenger seat, and there's movement in the back. But I don't turn my head because I try to pretend I don't notice them slowing down. I had my earphones in with no music as I didn't turn it back on after the bus ride. I just kept walking, hoping with everything I have that they'll leave me alone. I'm trying to walk faster, but I'm in so much pain a few tears start to fall down my face. I can hear that they're calling for my attention, but not what they're saying. Finally, I see the lane going up to my building. I take my backpack off and I shove my hand down the front pocket, fumbling because my nervous response is terrible. Thanks medication. And I can't feel my fingers. I'm shaking like crazy and I can't find my ID. At that point I'm close to a panic attack. My heart is beating too fast and I'm feeling close to fainting from the combined pain and terror. I turn to face the wheelchair slope when I see from the corner of my eye, the car stopping abruptly right next to the slope, and the car door slamming open. I don't know how I did it, because I was so close to fainting, but I managed to run the last 10 feet to the door and slap my ID on the reader, yelling at the door to open faster. I could hear people running behind me. The door finally opened enough for me to slip in, and I slammed it shut behind me. I then heard the men run into the door with a loud noise, and them cursing, and then yelling things to me. As you would expect, I didn't stick around to hear what they said, 
I fumbled with my keys to the point of almost dropping them before opening the door to my flat complex. I got inside on shaky legs, and as soon as the door closed behind me, I dropped to the floor and had the worst panic attack of my life. When I managed to put myself back together and painstakingly climb the three flight of stairs, I crawled into my sister's flat. We left our doors open for each other for precisely those circumstances, and I woke her up, telling her the whole story. She told me later I was deathly pale, so much that I scared her enough that she offered me to share her single bed that night. I was just that messed up to refuse. The worst part is, this isn't the end of the story. My sister went out to bars a lot more than I did, as she's able-bodied and drop-dead gorgeous. About three weeks later, she called me in the middle of the night as she was coming back from a bar. She had seen the exact car I described in the parking lot at the bus stop, and she didn't stop to see if there was anyone inside. She reacted and sprinted to our building. Of course, she was a lot faster than my drugged, disabled ass, so she made it to the door where I was waiting for her, having it open from the inside, just as the car stopped in the lane. After that, we left a note on our flat complex's door to explain everything to other people, posted about it on every university group that we knew of, and we contacted the police, who helpfully told us they could do nothing without catching them on the act, but that they'd probably send someone to patrol, as it matched the reports that they'd gotten that sparked the home blue van rumors in the first place. In the following year, it took to finish my degree, Neither me nor my sister saw those men or their car again, but we still hear from people the same kind of story being shared from other parts of the city. As far as we can tell, they're still active, and two years later, I'm still messed up about it. And this happened to me when I was in the third grade, about eight years old. My regular babysitter was ill, so my mom asked one of our neighbors, her name is Brandy, who had kids and babysat a lot of neighborhood kids, if she could watch my brother and I for a few hours. We were having so much fun at Brandy's house. When my mom came to pick us up, I asked if I could stay a little bit longer and finish Madagascar. We had just started it. She said that was fine, but I was to walk straight home after that, like maybe half a block, a block, so not far at all. So as the movie finishes, Brandy said I need to get home fast because it was dark out. As I'm walking home, this other neighbor, Dennis, is standing outside in his yard. I had seen Dennis around the neighborhood because his wife was very unforgettable looking. They have a daughter that was like maybe four-ish at the time, so I didn't ever play with her or know her family outside of seeing them around the neighborhood. Dennis starts calling me and saying, Hey, what are you doing? I say, I'm going home to my parents. Do you want to come inside for a little bit? He says, No, my mom told me to come straight home. I'm sure she won't mind. No thanks. I have a daughter who would love to play with you. We can make snacks. At this point, I was like, This is a red flag. Abort mission and I started booking at home. Then he starts following me, not quickly, just like walking like Michael Myers. Luckily, I made it home, and once he saw that I was approaching my house with my porch light on, he backed off. Now, I'd like to mention that behind our houses was a giant wooded area with paths that led to the nearby lake. So this dude could have caught me and dragged me into the woods or something, I try not to think like that, but what other motives could he have had, you know? Fast forward until I'm in high school working at a restaurant in town, and I see creepy Dennis and his wife all the time. Turns out they were secret shoppers at a restaurant. I don't think he recognized me working, thankfully. But either way, Dennis, let's not meet. I was living in Abu Dhabi when this happened, and I was 17 years old at the time. I've had a number of experiences from taxi drivers out there that could fit on the sub 
but this one was by far the worst and the creepiest and I'd like to share it with you all. It was Boxing Day 2012 and I was going to my friend's house for his Boxing Day party. He lived in a compound that was a bit of a drive off the island itself and although not rural suburbs by most standards, this area could be classified as such. These residential suburbs were also still mostly in development. Every block had a new building site, plenty of empty shells of houses, no security cameras at the time, etc. There was no pavement either, just rubble and sand patches split by tarmac roads. Now taxis in the UAE are crazy common. You just put your hand out and one pulls up. And back then, there was less security. There were no cameras or mics in the car, just the meter. I held the cab and sat in the front as a result of past experiences I had, and we set on our way. Things start normally. We talked as I normally would getting into a cab. How long have you lived here? Do you enjoy the place? Etc. Eventually, we're on the highway, and after we cross the water to the mainland, he pulls over on the hard shoulder and, without saying a word to me, pulls out his phone and calls someone. He's speaking his native tongue, and he's of South Asian descent, so I have no clue what he's saying, but I ask him politely to continue driving as the meter is still on. He nods, hangs up, and gets going again. This however happens a second time, again without word or warning, and now I'm suspicious. This time, I ask him again to keep on going, but he ignores me and keeps talking on the phone. We're now on the highway, so I can't get out for fear of going splat, not being able to hail a cab or being jacked for jaywalking. After a few minutes, he gets going again and we pull off the highway, still heading in the direction I needed to be. We reach the first roundabout where we need to make a right turn, but he goes straight over. Everyone knows where this compound is, it's the biggest one in the city, and as a cab driver, there's no chance he doesn't know how to get there, so now I'm even more suspicious, and I kind of have a feeling of trepidation. It's like I know this vibe and what might happen. I then ask him to turn around at the next roundabout, but he straight up ignores me. Now I'm getting agitated and angry, and I ask him to just stop the car and I'll get out and walk. But no, he literally just ignored me and kept focusing on the road. At this point, I'm shouting at him, numerous curse words, etc., and it's clear that he's got something else planned. Eventually, he pulls off the main road onto a dirt track that led a couple of hundred yards into a massive building site, and he keeps driving down it. He then turns to me and tells me to get into the back seat and repeats this, in an increasingly forceful manner, straight to the point where we're shouting at each other. At the end of the dirt track is an older little minibus with roughly five dudes that stood next to it. I don't notice this part immediately. All I care about is that the car is stopped and I'm in the front so I can get out. I'm not locked in. For whatever reason, I threw some money at him and jumped out of the car with my bag and started walking away, jogging back down the track. I can only imagine that the earlier phone calls he made were to those minibus men, as when I started getting away, they jump in the minibus and drive down to catch me as the taxi turns around and does the same thing. They all pull up in front of me, like police do in the movies when they stop a bank robber and jump out. The taxi driver runs right up to me, grabs me, and screams point blank in my face to get in the bus. I can still smell and feel the damp heat from his breath as it touched my face and the little bits of his spit hitting my cheeks. This honestly just enraged me, so I grabbed him by the throat and pushed him against his car. I scream something back at him, I can't remember what, and I let go. They then all get their phones out and start calling and messaging and moving towards me so I just got out of there as fast as I could. I would then run all the way down and back onto the main road and went to my mates on foot. Now I know I should have taken the number plate, ID number, etc. and called the police 
even when I was in the cab, let alone after it happened. However, I was a 17 year old with a bottle of Jack Daniels in my bag on the way to a party with all my mates drinking in a Muslim country with a drinking age of 21 years old. The paranoia of the trouble from that was enough to keep it quiet from the authorities, although I did tell every family member and friend. So yeah, if I could never meet you and your little minibus posse again, that would be great. This encounter happened earlier this year. My sister and I worked second shift at a factory in the next town. I didn't have a car, so we drove our Mustang everywhere. This car hates me. It has completely died on me in the middle of the night before, but only when I'm the only one in the car. And of course, the second anyone else gets behind the wheel, there's no problem. So I've named the car SOS, or Spawn of Satan. My sister's driving her car and we're cruising down the highway to work when her radiator starts to overheat. It's a rural area so we don't expect anyone to bug us. So we pull over and start putting water where it goes to try and cool it off. I'm still in the car by the way and my sister's doing the actual work. When this random guy pulls up and offers to help and tells her everything she's doing wrong. The only thing we've told this guy is we're trying to get to work. He tells my sister, well I can drive you to work, but your friend is going to have to stay here. That set off alarm bells, and my sister just gets in the car and says, oh, it's working now, thanks. He leaves, and we take off. About a mile down the road, we had to stop again, but it was at a store, and we knew some of the people. They lent us a hose, and we were able to make it to work safely. P.S. We're both girls. Anyway, creepy highway guy. Let's never meet again. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you like. That's available right below the video player. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Madu Saldil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that, if you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with these scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.